Welcome to the Texas Values Report. This is Jonathan Sines, president of Texas Values. Great to be with you on another glorious week in the state of Texas. My day this morning started in, I don't know, I'd say somewhat of a glorious way for a Texan. Looking out onto some farmland, seeing the sunrise. There were some longhorns uh, in the landscape somewhere. It was quite uh, majestic, if not like maybe from a dream, but no, it was a, a real fresh start to my day. I may touch on that later, um, which is always a great way to start, you know, whether, it, you know, we're talking about football or not. I mean, Longhorns, those kind of things, cattle, that's just a part of our backdrop a lot of times in the state of Texas. But, you know, it was crisp, cool. I was what I like to call South Oklahoma, close to uh, McKinney. We finished up a candidate forum last night. In Plano with our good friends at Preston Wood Baptist Church, Reverend Ron Kelly runs the Culture Impact Team there, of course, under the leadership of Pastor Jack Graham. And look, there's a lot of discussions about the roles that churches and pastors are playing this time of year, if you will, because of a very important election coming up. We know the main election day is November 5th. Early voting, two weeks of early voting starts on Monday, October 21st. A lot to talk about. And I heard there was a U.S. Senate race uh, debate last night. We'll chew on that a little bit. But look, you know our organization, we talk about the issues of faith, family, and freedom in the arenas of the courts, the legislature, and the media. And as I told the crowd last night as I was part of the uh, MC trio on the stage, government belongs to those who show up. So please, people, do not forget, very important election. And as Christians, we have an incredible role, an important role, to play and for you know oftentimes you know what christians decide to do uh, a lot of that has to do with what they're hearing in their own church from the pulpit as it should be right we should be taking leadership from the leader of our own church but sometimes we don't always hear that message about the importance of voting and the role that we uh, have as christians and so but someone i know who leads on that issue a lot is going to be our guest today on the texas values report pastor joe champion and his wife Lori. Uh, founded the Celebration Church, which is here in the Georgetown area, just north northwest of Austin in Williamson County, with a vision and heart to see people walking in their destiny. He has a tremendous background as a globally recognized leader and speaker. Serves on the board of One Hope Oral Univer- excuse me, Oral Roberts University and is also uh, a part of the lead team of the Associate, Association of Related Churches, which is an international church planning organization. And I also heard he's a LSU fan. We may talk some college football before this conversation ends. And he was one of our speakers at our policy forum earlier uh, this fall in September. Pastor Joe, good to see you again. Welcome to the Texas Values hey. Report. Thank you so much, and welcome to the Southeastern Conference, Jonathan. <laughs> how, a, how about a, it? A, a Longhorn. How, how hey, about it? You but know what? We haven't tussled yet with LSU yet. I don't think I want to, uh, <laughs> I, to, to be honest with you. It looks like uh, the way you guys are going to come in, I think you're going to win the whole, frankly, I think you're going to win the conference. So uh, I don't want to face you right now. It, it could it could be the case, and, and I'm trying to be uh, cautiously optimistic, you know, and as a Christian, right, I'm trying to be – humble and you know hungry good thing i'm not on the field right they got some other people that know what they're doing but it has been fun to be a fan great victory for the longhorns over the weekend but look you know sec texas i mean these states our state particularly you know we get a lot of attention you know whether it's sports the economy and so on people think a lot about texas they think a lot about churches they think about christianity you know whether we're part of the bible belt and so on the perception is that you know there's a lot of support and, and a lot of activity in the culture in the state of Texas has a lot to do with our Christian culture and our Christian beliefs. I know that's something that you've been a part of and you care a lot about, but you're also talking a lot about, you know, as we're, as I mentioned, early voting starts on October 21st, and it's not as if there are not other important times to talk about the intersection of God and government, if you will, than during a presidential year or even an election cycle. There's always an opportunity and room for that and value in it, but I don't think, I think it's fine to say it comes into a little bit more focus this time of year. And, and I think we're talking about it a little bit more, Pastor Joe, because, you know, every year I feel like I, I'm a part of an interview where some reporter says, well, the statistics show that less and less Christians are going to church and less and less people that are Christians are voting. And, you know, it's alarming. And so I think it's uh, good for us to do something about it. 
Um, tell yeah. us uh, your view about the role, and I know we'll talk in just a minute some specific you're teaching on, but but just overall your view of the role of Christians in our society and particularly in government and elections. Well, as a believer, we are the salt of the earth, not the salt of the church. We're the light of the world, not the light of a religious organization. And you can't read the scriptures without seeing over and over a repeated pattern of men and women of faith who obviously by God's power and the creator of this world, he throws them into society, he throws us into the nations, he throws us into where people are, and this is his world, the earth belongs to him, and the fullness thereof, and we're actually not the ones trespassing. And the idea that we're out of order or out of line, one of my favorite lines, Jonathan, is in Nehemiah 6, where Nehemiah you know, he goes from being an LSU Tiger wine taster, right? I mean, he's he's in the bar room. He's in charge of the wine list for the king. God calls him, and that's what happened to me, frankly. And um, and then he goes, I want you to do what we know Nehemiah would do. And in 52 days, he, he changes a city. He doesn't just change religion. He's not just changing a church or, if you will, just a, a people that are only worshipers. He goes into a city and he rebuilds a wall. He literally establishes a border between what is right, what is wrong, what is light, what is dark, reestablishes what is truth and what is a lie through that wall, which is simply just a cultural barrier. And uh, and then he is about to put the doors up. And just as he's about to finish, it says in Nehemiah 6, they came to him and they go, hey, they're going to come and kill you tonight. They're going to come and take your life. Why don't you just hide in the church? Literally, they said, go into the temple, close the door. You've done enough. You, you've done enough good for the day. You've done enough good for now. You just go in there and you just take your little time and go in that little church, hide yourself, because they're going to kill you eventually. And he goes, I'm not going to run. Why would I run? First of all, how can a man, he says this line, how can a man such as me run? How can a man such as I flee from the call of God? We have to come back to what we're called to be. We're, we've got to come back to who we are in Christ. We are not to be uh, on our heels, but we're supposed to be on our toes. We are called to be aggressive, not in a mean, uh, uh, as we know, judgmental, critical way, but we are not to be afraid. And Nehemiah, the Bible says, as soon as he says, I'm not going to hide and I'm not going to run, he, he sets the doors up and and we know what the story of Nehemiah is, and he reestablished life. And and we know the answer. We have the answer to life. And we're not trying to make people uh, Christianities, or if you will. We're not trying to bring Christianity in the world. We're trying to bring a presentation of who God is in Christ. And uh, so all that to say, uh, I don't think we have any other. I don't think we have any other plan from God. He he said, "Go and do what I've called you to do." And um, make a difference in the world. And yeah, that might cost you. That may be a painful situation. It may make friends unhappy, but that's what he said over and over. It's going to cost you, but it's going to be worth it in the end. Well, and look, you know something about the cost, right? You and I spent some time together earlier in our friendship, if you will, when you had some people in the area in which you lead a church and, and a community where you were simply trying to continue to bring the Word of God to more people. And sometimes yeah. some people are always friendly about that. You know, people want you to script, you know, skip over certain Scripture verses and parts of the Bible, yeah. and, and you choose to teach it as it is and, and completely. And we were thankful to be able to come along your side and walk with you through that journey. And But look, there were a lot of people during that particular circumstance that were also uh, surprised or, you know, encouraged to see how it was handled, but that's a part of being faithful to what we yeah. believe in, and, and you never know the impact it's actually going to have on someone um, in a positive way. Sometimes we can worry so much about what the people that you know may never agree with us, or you know, are, are looking to really just try to turn us upside down anyway, um, and, and have their own. Yeah motivations, we can forget about those people that are actually looking for something true and yes. pure, something that they can count on, you know, someone who's going to speak straight into them, but with some confidence. I like to use the word assertive sometimes instead of aggressive. That's me as a lawyer. I always come up with some kind of, you know, maybe a different way to phrase things, but, you know, essentially the same, right? I mean, and, yeah. you know, sometimes just stating, reciting the words in the Bible can come across, you know, in, in a way that, 
rubs people the wrong way in, you know, you're simply reciting the words. They are as they are. Yeah. But, you know, that's but I think that is the expectation of what you're supposed to do as a pastor of a church. And all of us have a responsibility as Christians. But when we're not involved in that process, and, and I know you lead a great church over at Celebration Church, when you're not involved, when we're not involved in that process, I mean, look, I don't think there's any question. It has an impact on the outcome of elections. Not that that's the end-all, be-all, but it's right. that certainly can impact um, our overall communities and culture and the respect that we see towards Christianity. Absolutely. And um, the day that we step out of our responsibility to be good stewards of the life that we have and stewards of the world that we live in, we've been blessed to live in this country. I come from a family of military. I don't come from a family of church people. But I do come from a family of military people. And my brothers, who are now believers, but they weren't when I became a Christian back in the late 80s, they would have no problem taking the truth of, let's just say, democracy literally around the world as generals and colonels. They commanded forces. They commanded nations. My brother was a CENTCOM, SOUTHCOM commander, uh, organized and led special forces all over the world. My other brother retired F-18 fighter pilot, Marine Corps. And if you were to ask them, why aren't you ashamed? Or why are you, why are you so bold about taking the principles of America or standing for the principle of America in more or in other areas? And they said, because we know this is right. We know this is the best way to live. And so how could we not want this to be known throughout the world? And of course, doesn't mean America is perfect. Doesn't mean the church is perfect. But we do know if you haven't been around the world, I'll just be honest, until you get out of America, you don't realize how good America is. And we've got to fight for it because there are people that want to take us backwards. There are people that want to take their particular political view, which is maybe not biblical or even godly, and twist it and turn it. And and again, for us to do nothing is to let people just... Frankly, they're going to they're going to instill their government. They're going to instill their way. And and we know we're the of the way, the truth and life. We're not trying to, make, again, people religious, but we are very honest about that. We do believe that Jesus is the truth. That's what brought me over the line of faith, not being raised in a Christian home. When I realized and came to the understanding that he was the truth, I just went, well, gosh, we just have to trust. And, and of course, we know his truth is love. His truth is goodness, kindness, meekness. His truth is laying down our lives, our lives for other people. And uh, I just think that we have an opportunity like never before. Though it's dark, Jonathan, and though there may be oppression, and you were with us in that battle of our central Austin location, I also believe that it becomes easier because the lines are less blurry. And let's face it, it becomes more and more real. Faith becomes more and more real. Courage becomes more and more real. It's kind of hard to hide in a uh, in the world that we're living in now as believers. And uh, I think people just need to know that's why Paul prayed over and over. God, grant us boldness. Grant us boldness that we would not be ashamed to speak the way that we're supposed to speak in love, with truth, in, in righteousness, but, uh, but not apologizing for what we know to be the answer to the hope that we all have that lies within us. We're talking with our good friend, Pastor Joe Champion from Celebration Church right here in the greater Austin area, if you will, in Williamson County, northwest of Austin in Georgetown. I know he and does, Travis. We got our Travis, Central Austin, that's right. too. Yeah. You do have Travis. And I know you do work around the country, right, if not yeah. the world, um, in some of the ministry work and the outreach that you're involved in. Tell us about your approach at your church and, and how other pastors and church leaders can duplicate that, if you will, in the next coming weeks as we get close to the November 5th main election day. Yeah. Well, maybe this will be a resource that people can jump on and look at what we did. I did a four-part series on the book of Titus. And Paul, of course, writing to Titus, who was literally left, he said, I left you in Crete. Crete was this one of the five larger Greek islands, as we know, and um, very difficult, very terrain was difficult. But then he goes, the Cretans are liars, they're lustful, and they're lazy. And he goes, it's true. This is a kind of a God-forsaken island that God literally put Titus on. And Paul says, you've been left there to straighten it out. But then he says, you've been left there to find leaders and to make leaders and to make disciples and, and to find people who are going to be difference makers. 
And he didn't say, I put you on this island to just impact the isle, uh, the church. He said, you've, you've been left there to impact the whole island. And of course, he starts with, first of all, speaking to, to Titus himself, that he's got a job and he's going he's gonna to fulfill it with the grace of God. And then he goes into finding leaders and developing leadership because you can't do this alone. And, uh, and then he just begins to repeat over and over to Titus about, the grace of God and, and what that looks like. It teaches us, grace doesn't say you can do what you want to do. Grace teaches us to deny ourselves and to and to live a life of righteousness and godliness. And now at the end he says, take the island, basically. And he said, God's going to be with you until you fulfill it. You're not alone. And when I'm looking at that story before even preaching it for the last four weeks and leading up to the election, you know, I did insert what I call the killer bees uh, and and just to, for memory's sake, I called it the killer bees. And as people are going to the voting booth and as people are looking at how to vote, I put it into all the bees. You know, the border. How does what's what what's the position on the border? What's the position on the Bible? The policies? Where are the people that are around those candidates? Who's who's more likely to go for or be pro Bible and pro book and and borders? And then I went into the bedroom. I talked about how and, and which policies support marriage and the marriage bed. Let it not be undefiled. I talked about bathrooms. I talked about what policies are going to be more supportive of, of the right bathrooms for the right gender and not crossing over. I talked I mean, about... Th uh, this is where we are in our society. And this is biblical, yeah. right? I mean, this, this was is the, all biblical. the teaching at my church a week or so ago, going back to the beginning, God made them male and female, right? I mean, and so, yeah. you know, you, you would think, okay, surely, you know, we're not going to be arguing about these things at some point, And here we are. And, and it's hard yeah. to not look at that as an attack on the Bible. You know, we see yeah. these things as efforts to ban the Bible. And I think we got a video clip, Ashley, is that right, of... Um, you and your sermon here, a little playback. Let's see if we've got it. Okay. When you do what you're supposed to do, listen, you're supposed to vote. You're supposed to vote. But when you go to the voting box, I want you, and I want you to see what Paul was saying to Titus. Look at everything through the Bible, the book, the truth. Let it be your lens. God, what does the Word say? Yeah, look, I mean, and so... You know, we encourage people to do that. We've had several pastors on in the past couple of weeks trying to help people have examples, right? Well, who else is doing it? What would I talk about? You know, what what books might I draw from? And so I think a great example here as we move towards early voting starts October 21st, November 5th. There are there's forces out there, though, that, you know, want to convince people like you and others, oh, we got you on a list now, right? We're going to be coming after your church because of what? Because of doing right. what pastors do, preaching from the Bible, bring it, right? But I mean, that, sure. there, but a lot of people are scared by that. You don't have to get up there and hold up a picture of a particular candidate and say, vote for this person, right? In order to use that pulpit to tell people, vote for biblical values, but please go out there and vote. And I think that's the approach you're taking. And I am in the sense also to add another layer to it, my son and my daughter-in-law, my son is the legislative director for Senator Barrasso out of Wyoming. Uh, he was with Jody Arrington, West Texas, and then he moved. He said he moved to the sanity of the Senate side so he can have more of a normal life. But all that to say, and then my daughter-in-law is involved in the political world with campaigns. And um, living and, and being up there with them to visit the grandbaby primarily, to get to know the people that are in Congress, the congressmen, the Congress staff, that's another thing I want people to broaden. Here's another angle, Jonathan. When yep. people go, okay, they want to narrow it down to a candidate, a whether it's going to be Harris or Trump. Well, I think one of the mistakes that, and we know, in the book of um, Judges about Samson, Samson's messed up because he took a narrow view on his view of God or his principles. All right, so for instance, God said, don't drink wine or strong drink. Well, what is he doing in a vineyard? Well, I wasn't drinking, but yeah, but you shouldn't have been in a vineyard. Uh, he told him, don't hang around dead people or be around cemeteries. And then he's eating out of the carcass of a lion. Um, God said, don't cut your hair. Well, why are you putting your lap? Why are you putting your head in the lap of Delilah? So what I'm telling people too, Jonathan, is broaden. You better broaden your picture of how you're going to vote 
and why you're going to vote. Because if you're not careful, well, I don't like her or I don't like him. Mm -hmm. You are too narrow. You're too, you better, you better go to the policies. You better go to the policy makers. You also got to look at who does life with what group. I mean, like what kind of parades are certain people promoting? What, where is the, where is the uh, promotions? Where, what, just look at where people are going. And in a bigger, broader way, I think that will help people even how to uh, look at this coming election. No, and I think that's instructive because, look, I mean, politics in, in political races certainly can take a lot of the personality of the candidates and a lot of focus can be around that. And look, that, it's not as if you want to ignore that completely or that, you know, you, you wouldn't be right. surprised that people do that. But the reality, it comes down to what are the policies that they're going to vote for, the type of people that are going to be in their yeah. administration. Or in their staff, right? We got a big Senate race here in Texas. We got Ted Cruz versus Colin Allred. We've got every Texas House seat is on the ballot, right? 150. Yep. Now, some of those races are unopposed, but many of there there are people on two different sides, and there might even be three people in some of those races. But there's a lot to look down, and so sometimes the only thing you can come back to to have a little bit of information is to to uh, go by, based on principle, not based on, well, who is that person and, you know, or do I know what that party stands for? Those things can be helpful. We've got a great guide, freevotersguide.com is a website. You can just see where the candidates stand on those issues. But yeah, I think sometimes people can get so wrapped up in the personalities, they feel like, well, I have to, you know, this has got to be somebody I want to be friends with or my best friend or whatever, something that's more of a personal nature instead of looking at, well, where do they stand on the issues? Because a lot of times the differences can be quite vast between two different candidates in a particular race. Um, look, we got two weeks left. Still an opportunity for pastors to talk about these issues from the ballot box. I think we get a little bit more attention in Texas, right? I mean, there may be some other states because of the size of our state and some of the things I was mentioning earlier, but so be it. I mean, some of that yes. can be more of a responsibility um, to, for us to, you know, be an example. You know, there. I mean, we've got a movie right out right now, Coach Joe Kennedy's movie, Average Joe. The guy had to go all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court to fight for the ability to pray on the 50-yard line after a football game, right? We know right. there are attacks on religious freedom. And there's no doubt in my mind that when you have the right people in office that support religious freedom, you're more likely to have, you know, yeah. maybe a little bit easier time practicing your faith. Yeah. Well, I uh, got saved at LSU, God's university, but I, I get literally born again my junior year at LSU. And then I start to ask the administration if I could pray before the game. No one was praying. So right before the national anthem, I'd get the opportunity with 80, 90,000 people, they would say, now the invocation. And I would just say, Lord, thank you for this day and this safety of each player and the safety of the people that are traveling. Lord, we thank you 2,000 years ago. You gave your life for us on the cross. And God, you said, whosoever believes in you will not perish, but have everlasting life. And I'd wrap up my prayer. My wife, who at that time was nobody that I knew, she remembers literally watching people come to faith during a prayer at LSU while drinking, while partying. Now, all that to say, I'm just sowing a seed. I'm hearing from people to this day that were in the stadium, heard the prayer. God somehow, by his power, obviously, his word touches people. But then, Jonathan, interestingly, uh, next year I get a phone call from the athletic de department. They said, Joe, we're not going to let you do that anymore. Nobody can pray anymore. And there are people that don't want to hear a prayer and uh, sadly, and of course, now, you, you just like coach, this coach Joe, right? Um, I, I did what I did. I, I, I tried to do what I could do to keep that going. But, you know, powers that be. But you know what? You just take advantage of it. Let's yeah. not quit. Let's not get discouraged. Keep going. You keep fighting. And uh, that's it's called the good fight of faith. It's a good fight. Well, look. Uh, and I'm like. Yeah, and if ahead. we don't continue that faith, the government will take over churches. I mean, yeah. the, the, yeah. you know, the phrase separation of church and state is not something that's in the Constitution, but it's alive and real for a lot of people that want to hear less about the Bible, yeah. right? They'd have no problems penetrating, if you will, those four walls, right? Like the mayor in Houston did, you know, subpoenaing the sermons of pastors. We had Pastor um, Dave Welch talk about that a couple of weeks ago. And so, you know, there is that balance there. There's that tug of war. I mean, you're going to have either yeah. sort of one side or the other. And, um, and we have to be honest with ourselves about that when we look at 
who we're voting for. We just got a few seconds left. I want to thank you too. I've had such a great opportunity to spend time with your son, Connor. I know great things that you are doing on the campus there of Austin Christian University in different ways. And so thank you for your leadership and God bless you. And and I appreciate you continuing to pray for the work we're doing here at Texas Values. Well, because of you guys, we were able to continue to build the church there in central Austin and now our campus and uh, going great and some other processes of other campuses coming along, Austin Christian University. I encourage people to check that out because it is going to be a university unlike we see anywhere in the country with a four-year business school with a minor in theology. So it's a business degree. We're going to have our full accreditation, Jonathan, in about a year and a half, but it's a business degree with a theology minor. But if a pastor wants to go into ministry, we know a lot of pastors struggle because they don't have a business background. They don't have any business acumen, as you know. So it's a both. It's going to have business. It's going to have AI. It's going to have a lot of tech. But we just want to raise up Daniels to go into the marketplace with uh, with the equipment that they need to change the business, to change the world and uh, to continue to build the kingdom of God here in Central Texas and throughout the world. Well, keep keep up the great work. We're so proud of what we are doing over there on the campus there at Celebration Church. And thank you for being our guest today on the Texas Values Report. We thank you for all you do. All right, I just got a couple seconds left. Our gala is November 2nd in the Dallas area. Speaking of church and prayer, David A.R. White, the actor, the main actor, the star of the God's Not Dead movie series. One of those just came out earlier this year in September. He's going to be our keynote speaker. Reverend Rafael Cruz, the father of U.S. Senator Ted Cruz, is going to do our opening prayer. We've got our MC Debbie Georgiatis, breaking news. Senator Angela Paxton also says she's going to be there and be a part of the program. We're so excited about that. Get your tickets, txvalues.org. We are a nonprofit organization. You don't have to come to an event to invest in our work, even though it's fun when you do. Go to txvalues.org. Values.org. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization where you can make your donation right now at txvalues.org. And that's how together we'll protect faith, family, and freedom in the state of Texas. And we'll talk to you next week on the Texas Values Report.